Hi, everybody. Ooh, that's that one. Um, yeah, so my name is Nicholas. I'm a software engineer with Facebook. Uh, I've been working at Facebook for about two and a half years, um, the whole time working on HBase. When I first started, it was a small team of about three people. Uh, now we have dozens of people working on a variety of uh, different applications and on top of the app server teams that are working with their own projects. Um, and I have since relocated from Mountain View, or sorry, Menlo Park to our uh, new office in New York. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit today about multi-tenant HBase solutions. We came here a year ago and we talked about uh, putting messages on top of HBase. And I remember when we first started talking about putting, getting away from MySQL, trying to try a new a uh, NoSQL style database storage solution. We were explicitly looking for something that would go the distance, that would have um, some real wheels to be able to do more than just messages, but to be able to serve a lot of different uh, services and have multiple benefits. So we had this problem where our previous NoSQL database was Cassandra, and it was meant to do inbox search, and it did inbox search well. But we never stopped and looked and said, OK, well, what's next? What's a good candidate after this? Are the designs that we're doing now making sense for the future? And so the same people that designed the system, the same first three committers, were in the room when we were sitting there and talking about using HBase. So everybody sort of had this idea in mind. And everybody, even as we were deploying messages, were thinking of what's next? Where can we go next? How do we tackle this? Um, this monster. I, I hear a lot of people uh, tell me about deploying with HBase or some other NoSQL database, and it's great. And they tell me about this one use case that they have for it. And then I go, OK, well, what's next? And a lot of them aren't really sure. Um, a lot of them are kind of, uh, I, I hear a lot of people, and they basically kind of look for, well, what's everybody else going to do? And then I'll try to put HBase on top of that. Um, and then you start to lose sort of the competitive advantage of like having a NoSQL solution, which is being an early adopter who's taking advantage of this optimized data flow for your use case. So you really need to sit down and think about what sort of data characteristics does your application have, and where would something like HBase or another database solution fit in? So just a quick show of hands, how many people um, are familiar with HBase? Awesome, there's like 10 slides I can skip. Great. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do an HBase overview, but I'm going to try to fly through that if I can, because I want to get to the good meat, which is uh, first ta talking a little bit briefly about how we design messages, then talking about when we started going to multiple tenants, how did we start? We started by doing physical multi-tenancy, separate partitioning. We, then we tried going the self-service route. And then we started going towards this more controlled route that I'm going to label hash out. Um, I'm going to talk about some sort of deployment recommendations towards the end of, you know, after you've rolled out your first HBase solution or first NoSQL solution, where, where do you go from there? Or um, I, I hear a lot of people just say, I want this, you know, generic multi-tenant cluster where customers can just put in whatever they want and it's just going to work. Like, is that a realistic expectation or should we be thinking about something different? And then finally, at the end, I'll talk about a little bit of the recent work, but I'd like to keep the focus of this talk on systems and systems design. So HBase, uh, in a nutshell, is an open source project that was sort of modeled after Google's big table. We've kind of taken it and run with it now. But the basic paradigm of having a master-slave architecture where um, the slaves are processing shards of user data and there's strongly consistent replication there, um, added with a log structured merge tree approach, which will allow you to have heavy writes. So to talk about that a little bit more, so the terminology that you guys need to know for database systems, the master is called the master. That's a great term. Um, the region servers are serving the shards of the database tables. So uh, that's the database layer. Underneath what's serving it, where it's actually persisted, is an HDFS, which is the storage layer. Um, the data nodes store the data volumes. The, we, I call this an avatar name node. Uh, everybody normally refers to it as a name node. It stores the um, file system directory structure, right? And the list of actions that you're taking on the file system. We have this avatar uh, name node 
uh, that we've developed that allows us to quickly switch between two. Um, that helps solve our single point of failure problem. And we're additionally, currently we're writing to an NFS. We're working with something called Bookkeeper where we can have high availability on uh, an automatic failover. So we're getting rid of our um, single point of failure problem there. Uh, for our coordination service, we're using Zookeeper. So coordination is like basic in-memory state. We started off by doing the in-memory state of the HMaster so that when the HMaster dies, the new one can come up, just uh, scan Zookeeper, find out the state, and go from there. We also store region server to master communications there now. So by horizontal scalability, I mean you have this table that has uh, rows zero through a billion users, say, and you try to partition it horizontally so that each region is maybe dealing with 10,000 users, and you can split you know, 20, 30 regions per server on there. Uh, automatic fail failure happens when the HBase client tries to talk to a server that's dead. Um, it can't reach it, so then it goes to the HMaster to find a new server. Uh, since there's three-way replication underneath, as you guys recall, it's okay that one server's down, two more can service the data, right? Um, so brief summary of the write path and read path for people not familiar with log-structured merge trees is you basically have this write-ahead log that we call the mem store that after the write-ahead log gets too large, it flushes, it creates a one of those little yellow blocks, which is like a HDFS file. And so you're doing all sequential I.O. For, for your writes in this case, where in a traditional like MySQL style approach, you have a B tree that's doing a lot of random writes when the write ahead log gets too full. And then for a read path, we basically have to do um, a spray to all the different locations where the data can be, um, and then collate it and do dupe, right? So, of course, that makes it more expensive for reads unless you have more advanced things like Bloom filters or other uh, ways to filter out these extra files, which I won't talk about now. So a little bit of uh, system overview here. We have this Haystack system, which is our photo storage system, which we also use for our very large attachments. The benefit there is that um, there's minimal amount of rewrites, right? Because you're not doing as many compactions as you would do in HBase or in MySQL. Um, and we really didn't need the relational schema. We had our row. Our row was a user. So what sort of use cases do we have in production now? We started by having messages back in two th 2010, um, and that took a long time to roll out, probably about a year and a half. It's a massive application that I'll talk about in a second. We also added uh, Facebook Insights, which is um, our likes and impressions counts for people that add like buttons and whatnot on their websites. Also had a self-service tier. That was our first shot at multi-tenancy. And additionally, we, ha we started Hash Out, which is a second multi-tenancy tier. So we, were, we really had this big focus in 2011 of like, can we do multi-tenancy or should we be thinking about another way? And then uh, this has sort of grown in 2012 that we're now uh, putting the operational data store in production. We're adding more, ha more apps to our multi-tenant tiers. We're getting various things like site integrity for doing um, an, uh, malicious user analysis, whatnot, that's heavy on the write patterns and then has occasional read patterns. So to start with, our flagship app was Facebook Messages. This was the one that we spent all our time on. This is the one, you know, when I'm on call, if there's, another, if there's a service that's down, um, I'm a little upset, I need to go fix it. If the Messages service is down, I'm not getting sleep that night. <laughs> you know, this is the bread and butter, it has to work. So what do we store in here? We store the pretty much what everybody thinks of as Facebook messages. All those snippets that you have, um, the message metadata indexes, you think of, you go click on the mailbox button, you go to a front page, all that stuff is of course pre-cached. So that's stored in. Uh, search index if you're trying to find um, a word in the message, et cetera. And then the uh, attachments in really large messages, since they're just right once, uh, never rewritten. We wanted to use Haystack for that since we already had the uh, system built out. So some quick stats on where we are today. Um, our 
data growth pattern has continued to escalate. We're at around uh, 9 billion messages a day that's being sent through this system. Uh, it ends up uh, translating into roughly 90 billion read and write ops to our H-based tier. And it's also, when we're, I'm talking about this number, we're talk, we, I'm horizontally sharding. Uh, we have multiple clusters that are running HBase. So um, this would be amazing if a single 100 node cluster could do this. But you know we didn't have those tricks. Um, it ends up happening that we have about a half and half read and write ops pattern. We were actually expecting a larger amount of write ops than we had. Um, due to like cache efficiency, but we were able to work around that and get really good efficiencies on our reads as well. And um, our storage, we're at 4.5 pet petabytes, and that's compressed and not replicated. So with replication, you're talking about around 15 petabytes, and then that's all compressed as well. So when you're talking about uncompressed data, it's around times four, so you're talking about 60 petabytes of data. And our growth is around 400 terabytes compressed a month. So we had a very high write volume. When you think of messages, you're constantly getting messages from your friends, sending messages to your friends, and you're never deleting them, right? So our database characteristics were we, we knew we were always going to grow, and we were always going to have a uh, the, the data set's never really going to stabilize. We're not trying, going to just delete a user's message without their knowledge, right? So we needed this system that ha would be able to handle the scalability, continue to grow, uh, which means that it also needed to be highly elastic and allow for automatic failover. So we needed the system where we could go in and add a rack at a later. We don't really need it right now, but we need the ability to be able to do that in the future, right? And we need the ability to capacity plan for that, right? With MySQL, this is all sort of these manual steps that you're having to go write one-off scripts to do, right? We, we wanted to be able to have a system that was designed so that we could add this functionality in and forget about it. And then we wanted strong consistency within a single data center. This makes perfect sense for messages where you don't want to have this uh, interaction where user Nick ch chats to user Tom and then uh, he sees Tom's message, uh, you know, out of order with his. You know, it has this really bad experience. Um, and then, yeah, we we needed to use it for MapReduce. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys have this same problem where you do these big analytics things on behind the scenes, or you have to go run large jobs. We have a number of large MapReduce jobs. We were originally thinking of not even putting MapReduce in the cluster. We were thinking that was it, and if he. Um, however, after rolling out and after seeing that we had that MapReduce cluster there, we use it very critically in most of our large applications. So a basic overview of the schema for our messages was we have three different column families in there. Uh, column family, basically when you create a table uh, on the row, you have column families that denote um, continue, uh, where you want your spatial locality, right? So each column family roughly ends up becoming a single file, and so all rows of the same column family are stored sequentially, right? So we had three of these for our three main flows, which was uh, actions. It was a log of all our user actions. Here's a new me message. Uh, I deleted the message. I flagged it. I replied to it, etc. A snapshot of the front, basically the front page or the the like last 20 messages when you go click um, on viewing Tom's messages to you. And then uh, keywords, everybody knows what search is. So an example of how we're using the schema, um, is the perfect example is keywords, where a lot of people, so something that's interesting is um, HBase has four dimensions, right? And most people will normally end up using three dimensions. They end up using the row, the column family and the column. And with the timestamp, they just do system.now, right? And that's a great way to do it, but we are, you can use this version as an extra dimension um, to be able to automatically handle the duplication for you, um, to be able to handle relative positioning for you. So this is a perfect example of we use the message ID as the version instead of the timestamp. So this allows us, since we know that our 
message IDs are monotonically increasing, then we can get the last 10 messages if we just look for the last 10 versions, right? So th the, the basic trick that we played here, so you think of your generic mailbox store, and it's basically, here's an uh, action log, here's a caching tier, and here's a searching tier, right? The caching tier and the searching tier is, ends up becoming most of your data because you're having to compute it. But what's actually critical for you is the action log. If you have the action log, you have the single source of truth, you can go ahead and uh, redo the other two column families, right? And where a lot of your efficiency gains are coming in is how efficiently you're handling caching and when you're bringing blocks in, right? And that, that's where most of the schema migrations come, not for the schema migrations aren't, or sorry, schema iterations, not migrations, are coming from there. They're not coming from the actual action log itself. Uh, so that basically allowed us to do a custom low volume backup solution where we were able to, sh uh, for having um, uh, multi-data center support in the case of disaster recovery, we just ship the action logs off to the different data center um, so that if they're on, in the worst case, we made a script that could go replay all those action logs and recreate the other ones on the other side of the coast, right? And we needed to do that anyways every time we kept iterating on our schema. So it wasn't extra work on our part. It was low volume cross DC. And it also allowed us to sort of, uh, the probability that you're gonna have a full data center failure, it was minimal enough that we were able to sort of stall that problem um, and work on it at a later time when we had more resources. I think that's like one of the biggest things I hear people talk about is, uh, they talk about HBase and the, f the functionality and utilizing it, and they say, you know, I just don't have enough time. Um, and they, a lot of people talk, uh, like Facebook people have time, which we don't. <laughs> we, we keep on getting like uh, all these pressures from the app application server, and I think what we've tried to, really hard to do is prioritize really well prioritize like what's important and what we would like to have in, and are there ways that we can make quicker solutions um, and go and redress, uh, address the problem later. Because if, if you're not fully invested in the problem, maybe you're not gonna make the best solution for it. So that was our first iteration on our schema. It, it allowed us to do three different major schema iterations. Um, first, for our caching tier, we just did a whole blob store, like here's all the user's data. Um, which was great for the first month until Mark Zuckerberg is sending a uh, thousand emails a week and he ends up having like a one gig snapshot. Then we realized we had to change. So we switched to per thread snapshots. So, you know, when Mark's talking to Priscilla, then, you know, that's all one thread. But then when he's talking to me, that's rarely accessed. So that's a separate thread and doesn't get loaded in. <laughs> um, and then finally, we even went finer granularity where you know, it's what Mark normally reads isn't, you know, he occasionally wants to go and see, uh, you know, his conversation with Priscilla from like six years ago or whatever when he was starting the company, but he normally just wants to see like, what are they gonna do for dinner tonight, which was one of the last 20 messages, right? So that's, so you wanna cash on the, you know, last 20, 20 to 40, et cetera. So what did those three schema iterations do? Just as an overall, uh, I put this chart in here as um, maybe something that a lot of you guys will see on your systems as you iterate on the schema, where we had this horribly inefficient snapshot since it was global, where uh, if you look the action, like I said, the actions was all that mattered. And so that's actually only like 2% of all the data that we were writing and reading in the tier. Um, and as we got more efficient at understanding HBase and were able to shard, uh, so we were at this snapshot phase. And then the app server team came to us and said, why can't you make HBase more efficient? And a lot of times the answer ended up being pushing back to them and say, you know, do you understand what your data flow characteristics look like? And the, the answer was they weren't. The answer was we needed to build monitoring equipment to show them like, look, this is how much data you're putting into HBase versus how much you think you're putting in. So they thought they were doing probably more like this bottom level where 
the actions ends up be the actions and the keywords end up being roughly 50/50 with the snapshots when instead the snapshots were like 97% of the data it doesn't matter how we optimized hbase you need, the the problem was in hbase the problem was the app server and as soon as the app server started getting more efficient with how they were doing snapshots um and making them smaller and smaller then all of a sudden all the hbase problems started surfacing right so i think that's a an interesting point where a lot of times when you're developing these systems or when you see that there's this hbase problem a lot of times you want to look at the app server and see is it as efficient as as it can possibly be can we monitor it um and i uh, really if you know hbase isn't a perfect system everybody knows my sequel isn't a perfect system and they have a decade of warts you know on top of us right we can only hope to be so buggy um but the yeah the point being that you need to have the sort of tools where you can push back and iterate on this so we learned a lot we use mapreduce to upgrade our schema do deletion jobs um finding users in a cell i just put this in here to say we are actually using mapreduce and here's some examples of how we're doing it um So we have this messages app up and going. Where next? Right? This is what we're all wondering about. And the other interesting thing is we're we're doing this selection criteria as we're rolling out messages. So we paired like our system design with actual the nitty-gritty of going in and optimizing HBase and doing the performance features. We were we weren't, you know, going 100% into messages and then just sort of having that uh oh my gosh, we're done. um i don't know what to do now right you need to start planning for the future as you're rolling out and in the middle of the storm so our our process was we wanted a an early phase where we wanted to understand you know why do you want to put stuff on to hbase or is there a system that we're working with closely or that we have friends that work on that seem like it should be a good use case we really need to understand it um we want to do some sort of like initial schema design so we want them to try to prototype what they think the schema should look like and that gives us a good idea of how well we think they understand hbase right so we can take their schema design and then iterate on it so a perfect example like i said like the timestamps you know maybe there was a perfect ex- example for being able to do timestamp filtering that they weren't employing right so we just have them do the schema and it allows us to focus in on do they really understand column families do they understand columns what sort of functionality of hbase do they understand and what sort of stuff do we need to help them learn so the pre-production phase we do the shadow testing where normally the systems that we end up taking over um since we know their use case they're normally in production and we would rather double write and we'd like to immediately see um you know after iterating on hbase some and iterating on the product some that we can get comparable um performance between the MySQL system and the HBase system before we transition over and the base uh, I moved on me right so the shadow testing basically we do as- asynchronous puts and gets um to the HBase tier and then we do synchronous puts and gets to the MySQL tier so it ends up flooding the HBase tier with just as much data as MySQL gets but in the case where it can't access the hbase tier because it's crashed or some other reason um you know we don't need 100% de- data integrity during this time we're just trying to see if it can handle the load and the real world characteristics the other th- big things are is it right dominated you know right now we have these log structure merge trees they talk about all these wonderful algorithms um the the, the easiest algorithm to implement is sequential io right So instead of like really analyzing like how absolutely efficient are these compaction algorithms there are plenty of use cases within Facebook and in the real world where MySQL is just an absolutely horrible fit because of the B tree approach um so if we have these right dominated uh use cases why don't we go ahead and tackle those first we can gain more experience we can have smaller uh features that we need to add to the system instead of doing this completely desperate approach where we're having to add in tons of brand new functionality we're having to do a lot of like server side logic to handle this really complicated case 
And the other thing is, is there a large data volume? We don't look, a lot of people set up like two node clusters. We end up having, um, I think our smallest cluster is like a 60 node cluster. So we have somewhere between 60 to 200 nodes that we're doing. Um, so it does make sense, you know, it, if you're wanting to gain um, knowledge base on NoSQL, then it might make sense to do a small cluster setup. But realistically, what we were looking at for Facebook is we were wanting to find users where MySQL was not just bad, it was like a huge pain, and it was a, a great burden. We could get really substantial wins. And then further, do, do they need operational support? We didn't want to get one that was small enough that they wanted to go develop the feature, then walk away. We wanted somebody that knew that they were going to need to be monitoring the cluster just as we're monitoring the cluster. So the sort of other aspects that we look at is we look at cluster sizing, like what are the read-write characteristics, um, how much do you uh, estimate that your data size is going to be, and also the number of uh, ops per second, read and write. Uh, a very common problem that we got into was people would say, oh, we're only doing writes, but they were doing increments, which is a read and write. So that ends up overloading the that ended up you know, doubling or more because since log structure merge trees are an uh, array of files. Then also, like, what sort of uptime guarantees do you have? Um, and then how are, are you okay with planned and unplanned outages, right? So we're doing pretty well on our nine scale, but we're, still, we're not the same as MySQL. We're not at five nines yet. So we didn't, need, we didn't want a very critical case where they absolutely had to be up, right? We didn't want to take on like the ad system right now. We're still trying to evolve this database system. So other aspects of schema design is, um, you know, do you need one or multiple column families? That's one of the most common problems where people will put all their data in one column family. And the problem with that is you don't get correct spatial locality. The other one is, uh, do you need a new column family or a new table? Um, one of the biggest problems that we ran into was uh, if you have two column families, they're both resided on the same region, so they're located together. So you normally want everything, when you're thinking in general like with messages, you have a user as the row. And you would rather have the user be completely up or completely down. And if you put the user's messages and the user's search on uh, a different table, they might be on different region servers. So you could be possible that you could access the search, but not messages or vice versa. You want to be able to give full functionality to the user or none at all and give them a consistent view, right? Man, this moves on me. All right. Um, so physical multi-tenancy. Um, after we did our selection criteria, we found a couple big wins here. The first one was real-time Facebook insights which was basically analytics for social plugins on top of HBase. Like I said, like your like button, whatnot. Seeing um, for external people to see the sort of engagement that people are having on Facebook. Um, this is obviously something that's massive volumes of writes, right? Every time somebody clicks on a like button or views a like button, you want to be able to do a write on here. But the company is only going to occasionally come and see how their analytics is doing, right? So before, what happened was we would go ahead and put this in HDFS. We would run Hive with MapReduce um, and populate it into MySQL, right? Which gave us about a 15-minute delay because of all these Hive and MapReduce jobs. Uh, so now we use we still put it in the HDFS uh, for durability, but then uh, Puma, which is our app server for this insights tier, um, is actively uh, tailing the logs and then populating HBase immediately, which reduces our downtime from 15 minutes to 10 to 30 seconds. Right? So this is a perfect example of like, we have all these use cases where there's just volumes and volumes of writes and then a, a handful of reads, but the reads that we have are like point queries, right? Well, Insights is a perfect example of you just want to know how your website's doing. You don't want to know how every website in the world is doing. So when you have these high volumes of writes and point queries, 
um, a lot of times they started with sort of an ETL approach, and then we could easily migrate them on to this HBase style approach. The lessons that we learned from doing at, uh, this insights, one of them was don't tackle more than you could handle. So we went the other way where we were really worried about making sure that we were relevant. And we ended up uh, uh, trying to do like about four different products at once. I'm trying to make this look linear. It's not. Um, that ends up meaning that we give poor quality of service to everybody. So we, needed, we decided instead, after a, a while of ha making some mistakes and having a, a bad clusters, that we were going to scale down our users and concentrate on one or two users at a time so we could give good wins to a limited set. Um, GC tuning can hurt. I think everybody has learned that. Um, G a lot of times, the GC is not the problem. It's your understanding of how GC works that's the problem. We've had multiple occasions where we've we had one occasion uh, four months ago where we did a 5,000 line patch where we we're going to do massive pinning on unpinning of, um, of the block cache because we were thinking that block cache churn was ending up hurting our GC. Uh, what we ended up finding out instead was that one of the development branches was doing asynchronous RPCs and the RPC was getting aged into the tenured region in GC and that's what was actually causing all the the GC pauses. It was that we didn't properly tune it because we added this new feature and didn't do any due diligence on it. Um, yeah, other, other massive wins are um, caching on the app server or batching on the app server. So the problem with an increment, every single increment is a put, right? So plus five is one put. Five plus ones are five puts. So that means you have five times the amount of volume going into your data center, right? Even more so when you're doing periodic aggregation of like hourly stats, right? Like a very common thing is you make like four different column families, one for immediate, then, you know, hourly, daily, weekly, something like that. So if you write to all of those column families, that's four puts, right? And say you're doing a thousand increments, right? That's a thousand, that's 4,000 puts. When instead you could do 1,000 puts and then have the have a MapReduce job come and do that one more put. Uh, next one was the operational data store, which again is basically graphs, right? Like how's my data doing? Is the site up or down? Is there a network traffic spike? This is a very common ops thing. They have like open TSDB out there and various other applications. And so again, you're constantly writing all these metrics and you're only analyzing a little bit of it. Um, and additionally, it's, it's really hard to scale with MySQL because you add a new app and then all of a sudden you have a hot row problem. So you need to be able to manually shard before this was taking up all their time of physically sharding it. And then uh, also the reads are for only, mostly for the most recent data. I'll talk about that in a second. So our schema design was basically to have three column families, a raw table, a roll up to 15 minutes window in the hour, and then a roll up to hour in the day bucket. Um, and then we have MapReduce jobs to do this promotion, like I would, had just said. Um, interesting fact, you have uh, these compactions, right? You have these log structure merge trees that you're writing out uh, an array of B trees and then compacting them. Um, they're also the same thing as a time order data storage. So that you know that your last, you say, uh, the common query is, I want my last hour's worth of data. Right? But we store in our time series database um, like a month's worth of data, right? So you might as well, uh, you can add in timestamp optimizations so that you're only doing queries on, say, those really small red uh, H files that are easily lo loaded into cache, right? And then the larger ones that are from a couple days old never get touched. Whereas if this is MySQL, this is one large B tree and your minutes um, data is going right in there with your day data and you're getting bad spatial locality when you're loading it in. Uh, other lessons learned. So we were originally going to try a split tier architecture. The idea was put our HDFS nodes on one cluster or our HBase on another. Um, we basically wanted to pretend that HBase was memcache. Um, don't do that. So lessons learned. 
Um, not only is memcache like way more efficient than HBase is right now, but additionally, the traffic between our nodes because of flushes and compactions are actually way more than the traffic that we're giving back to the user. So we had top of rack saturation when we were trying to do communication for flushes and compactions on this setup. What did work, however, was we talked to the ODS team. We, they said, you know, we said, do you need high availability? They said, no, no, it's OK. If, if it's down for a minute or two, it's no big deal. Um, and then we went into pre-production. And then people started beta testing it. And then people started screaming. And then directors started getting involved. And then we realized that we needed high availability, right? So an easy way to do high availability is uh, just make another cluster, right? Though it is bad that you get 6x replication. Um, but we ended up having this dual cluster architecture that gives us immediate high availability. Um, we're able to use, again, our MapReduce cluster to do eventual consistency between the clusters. And we already knew that we were going to come up with a cross-DC solution. So although it's temporarily 6x replication here, we were going to need that for cross-DC anyways to do master-master. Um, so with a couple more minutes left, I'm going to talk about uh, the multi-tenant use cases. So we have this self-service tier. The original idea was optimistic multi-tenancy, I called it, which is allow users to create a table, tell them that you know, this, is pro this will fail if you do bad things because it's immature. And you know, users are they're smart Facebook users. They'll do the right thing. That's not true. Um, we've, we thought that, hey, we'll just monitor it with metrics, with uh, RPC monitor to see which RP3C threads are um, most active and then also slow query logs and printing to be able to analyze post-mortem. Um, problems. Users have a relative opinion of what a lot of data is. Uh, we learned that site integrity was a good application for its own cluster because they thought they would just put themselves on the self-service tier and then all of a sudden needed 60 servers of the self-service tier. Um, another interesting anecdote is since they don't always label, label their tables well, uh, we didn't think it was site integrity. We thought it was this other application that did error logs. So we kept on co going and complaining to that team. And they said, well, what are you talking about? We don't own that table. And so then we had to do this massive hunt. And it's, it's even better when you know, these people are testing their applications. So they're going and writing and reading. And then they stop for like a week. So how do you debug that? So the lessons that we learned were to physically isolate the users, to block abusive users, and promote heavy users uh, to their own clusters. So this led to hash out, which is controlled multi-tenancy. So it's a generic key value store that we already had in place um, that was running on MySQL that was easy to move here. And what we basically end up doing for our architecture is we force users to have their own app ID and key value. Uh, we hash on, do an MD5 hash on the app ID, so therefore we can isolate users to, uh, uh, for that particular app ID to a set of n clusters out of, our, say, our 100 node cluster. So even if they abuse the system, they're only abusing a handful of the shard. And then when they get, we have it backed by memcache, because a lot of times when you have these heavy read situations, um, and again, like, HBase isn't memcached. Don't pretend that HBase is memcached. You won't get the same performance. Um, it's not a self-service model in that each, map is, each app is reviewed, and there's metrics for each app, so we can see who the top 10 offenders are. Um, and so the, this was, um, you know, we could have tackled it inside the HBase core, but we only needed a handful of features. We didn't want to disrupt the HBase core because there was a lot going on. And this wasn't complicated. This was a summer intern project that we ended up doing. And the big thing has been on the monitoring of it, right? the ops section. So what we observed is we needed memcache. We needed friendly names for apps, lessons learned from the last one. Um, and capacity estimation is hard. Uh, people say that they don't have a lot of data, then they do. Um, so you really need the correct tools. You need these slow query logs. You need to look at the RPC monitor. HBase, all, the open source version, has a lot of this stuff built in if you know how to use it, if you know how to go look through the pretty printer to sort of see what puts are coming into your system. Um, and analysis ends up solving a lot of our problems versus features. So let's see. 
we're getting towards the end here. So some sort of deployment recommendations. Um, you need a single, you need graphs. You need monitoring. You need all these visibility into all this visibility into your system. HBase has it already. The big thing is making sure that you're using it. Um, constant upgrades. So we got into this problem. The question is, well, why aren't you on the newest version of HBase? And the problem is, if we're on the newest version of HBase, which version caused a bug? Uh, and so even beyond like major versions of HBase, minor versions, when we make like small fixes to it, we try to have it all unified across all the clusters on the tier, so it's really easy for us to debug the various multi-tenant use cases. And then, yeah, each app has its own demands, ramp up slowly, um, don't try to tackle more than you can handle. Uh, everybody wants HBase now, everybody wants these services now, uh, but you, as ops people or as developers need to be learning about HBase, need to gain in your understanding of how the system works and the subtleties and the tuning. So you, you know, don't have the other the app server team end up rushing you because it'll give a bad experience for everybody. Um, so I'm going to skip the recent work, but basically we've done a lot of it. Um, the biggest ones lately have been data block encoding, which allows you to um, compress keys on demand. Um, and it gets around you having this schema problem where you need to like bit encode everything. You can just make generic strings and have them compress. Um, and then also we switch to uh, per region data placement, which allows us to do automatic failover with data locality. Um, but yeah, again, I'm running out of time here. The future work, we're doing name node HA. The New York team is working on cross DC replication. We have a lot of great things planned. Um, and we are 1% finished, as the Facebook people like to say. Uh, thanks. All right. Do we have time? I think we have time for two short questions. All right. Other questions? Any questions? Over there. Uh, excellent talk, thank you. Uh, what kind uh, of uh, HBase distribution or um, version are you using currently? Uh, so what we're using currently is uh, roughly called 89. Um, so the problem was when we went to production on messages was right when the whole master rewrite was done. So we weren't necessarily comfortable with the new master rewrite. We've no mostly kept the region server side in sync with um, the current uh, production branch. So it's mostly running most of the features off of like even trunk right now. Um, but the master is a, a mix of the old master and some of the new master features. All right. Oh, let's thank the speaker again.